President Biden is facing a large set of challenges as he runs for re-election. The most unique challenge of all, no one his age has ever won the presidency, and voters are worried. It's worth pointing out that former President Donald Trump, Biden's likely opponent, is 77 and has been afflicted by more than the usual number of gaffes lately. Very big hello to a place where we've done very well, Sioux Falls. So Sioux City, let me ask you, how many people come, how many people come from Sioux City? Sorry for the cliche, but the next election, now exactly a year away, could be the most important of any of our lifetimes. Next. This is Washington Week with the Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. So much to discuss this week, including, of course, the Middle East War, domestic politics around the Middle East War, along with the reign of the next Republican to test out the Speaker's seat. Uh, joining me tonight in conversation are Dan Baltz, the chief correspondent for The Washington Post, Adam Harris, my colleague and staff writer at The Atlantic, Susan Page is the Washington bureau chief for USA Today, and Alex Thompson is a national political correspondent for Axios. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about something that you wrote, Alex. I pick you to start. Um, you, you've been covering uh, the White House and and Biden and the, and the Democrats, and this week you've done some interesting reporting about how a large group of uh, healthy-sized ego Democrats with national profiles or people who think they have national profiles are kind of sort of passively aggressively jockeying for 2028, but also maybe a little bit jockeying for 2024. Tell us about your reporting. It was a really fascinating story in Axios. Well, thanks. And I appreciate you calling me first. So uh, the first time on the show, that's <laughs> that's that's part of the Hazy initiation <laughs> process. Yeah. Uh, so I sort of call this, it, it's basically the just-in-case 2024 primary, which is all of these Democrats who do likely have White House ambitions or at least want to set themselves up for it, you know, they are making moves, maybe in this case a little bit earlier than usual. They are starting national PACs. They are making sure to somehow happen to visit South Carolina um, at all times of year. They are making sure to call donors, you know, go around states and, and meet with state party leaders. And the reason for this is because there is still some doubt that the 80-year-old Joe Biden is not going to end up being on the ballot next fall. And the, the, the reason you would do this is, so you had Cory Booker, he's going to go to South Carolina this next month. J.B. Pritzker in Illinois, he just started a national abortion rights group. He has already cut a check for $2 million, and I have heard that he is probably going to cut a few more of those big checks. Gavin Newsom obviously just went to China also has started his own national PAC. And essentially, these group of Democrats are, it's a little bit of a hedge, essentially, about the concerns with Biden's age. And it's a win-win, because they are still supporting the president. But let me ask you, you say it's a win-win, but I have to imagine that at the White House, they're a little bit like, hey, guys, just ease up a little bit. I, I can tell you, having had uh, some off-the-record conversations with the Biden campaign, I, I, I don't think they were thrilled. Um, and this is what these Democrats have been trying to do, which is to you know, gingerly increase their national profile, but not too much. And I do think it's getting to a head here, where some of them are going a little bit too far. Yeah. Susan, I, I'm going to ask each of you this question, but what are the chances that Joe Biden doesn't actually run? It's the chances are not uh, zero. Um, you know, politics is not a straight line. 
We've got a, 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 some time to go, not a lot of time to go before uh, Joe Biden could choose not to run. Um, I don't think Joe Biden gets pushed out, but I think it is conceivable that there's some combination of factors involving his health, concern about his family, a feeling that Hunter Biden is being mistreated because he is president, his father is president, um, that could contribute to a decision on his part to pull out. I don't think it's likely. Not, it's not impossible. I also think it's not impossible that Trump, through some combination of factors, turns out not to be the nominee. I think we should be modest about what we know is going to happen in politics before it actually happens. Right. And, and Dan, I note that LBJ, we do have some time here. LBJ dropped out or, or stepped aside uh, in, 19, in, uh, in March 31st of 1968. So there is time. That, of course, forced the decision into the convention. And so my question to you, apart from giving us the entire history of the Democratic Party, if you could, in the next two minutes, <laughs> uh, my question to you is, at what point would a Biden decision not to run again really mess with the, the opportunities the Democrats may or may not have this, this campaign? It's a really hard question to answer, honestly. <clears throat> I think uh, early spring would be the latest. But even then, I mean, at this point, I think, I agree with Susan. We should be humble about anticipating or predicting the future. But I think it's unlikely that the president will not run unless there's probably a health episode. I think that would be the most contributing factor. I think other things suggest that he's determined to run because he thinks he's done a good job and he thinks he's best positioned to beat Donald Trump. Um, and he's got some more things he wants to do. And he's president and he likes the job. Um, but <clears throat> there is this nervousness around the party um, among, among politicians and among a lot of voters. This question of, is he going to run? Should he run? Maybe it would be better if he didn't run. Um, I think all of that is pretty well screened out by the president. Um, but people worry about what would happen <clears throat> if he didn't, you know, if, if suddenly he had to drop out. Right. Adam, I mean, one of the one of the issues here, obviously, if he were um, polling at 50, 55 percent popularity approval ratings, we may not even be talking about this, even though he's turning 81. Um, but he's not at in the 50s. He's not in the 60s. He's 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 not doing that well. And it's hard to move that that number. You know, Talk about uh, talk about what is 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 dragging his reputation down because you know and and I think you know this from covering the White House you all know this from covering the White House they argue the president's people argue that actually the record is pretty good um, and there's there's some proof behind that so I mean talk talk about what what's the what's the, what's behind the the persistence of the problem. You're right. If you look across the record, the Biden administration's record on the economy, things that people say that they care about has been pretty good. Um, but if you look across the poll numbers, you do see consistent declines from his numbers in 2020, from his numbers in 2022. I mean, if you look at black voters, um, for example, um, the numbers are down. You see a, a sort of small gap beginning to appear from people who say that, you know, I would I previously voted for President Biden. Now I would support a President Trump, a hypothetical President Trump candidacy. It's a small figure, but um, it is a figure nonetheless. And, and those but this margins... But this are... is a small game in the sense that you need a few thousand votes in a series of states in order to tip the entire thing the other way. Exactly. And you've seen the, the Biden campaign putting out radio ads on black radio in, in Wisconsin, in Georgia, right, and in places where they know that they need to shore up that support in order to be successful. Wait, wait stay on this subject for a second. It's not black female or Latino female, it's it's male, right? I, I mean, is, is the softening happening across gender more than more than race? Well, it's a, it's a mix, right? Because some of it is is also across the sort of college education gap. You've seen larger gaps develop in between black voters with college degrees, black voters without college degrees, not just generally non-white voters with and without college degrees. Um, but in, in terms of black males, even in the 2020 election, in the 2016 election, you saw these efforts from Democrats up into election day to really shore up their support among black men, because that is a demographic um, that has, you 
you know, heard promises before, right? They, you, you have this sort of, um, this feedback loop, the cycle that happens where they, they go out and they're told to vote and they go out and they, they, they vote for the candidate uh, and then they don't feel the economic impact. They don't feel the, the impacts on their community. And so it, it becomes a cycle of needing to continue to shore up that support right. or show them that you're actually working for them. Right, how serious a problem is this? I mean, there's there, there's deep anxiety all the way to the Oval Office. I mean, the fact of the matter is that Joe Biden is exactly where Donald Trump was at this point, I guess, like you know, four years ago. And that is very frustrating to the president. And the other thing that the reelect campaign has been doing is they've been spending almost a million dollars a week on television ads. And that, that, that is very early to be spending this amount of money. And almost all those ads are on positive Biden ads, Bidenomics ads. Biden going to, to Kiev and meeting with Zelensky ads, trying to show the president a, in a sort of heroic manner, the numbers haven't moved. And that's why you, you know, uh, I actually think Dan's colleague just this last week reported that uh, Joe Biden wants to double down, spend more money on television um, to try to move those numbers. On positive? Yes, on positive. Not, I mean, there's been a few anti-Republican anti about uh, abortion rights ads, but o the overwhelmingly amount of money has been spent on pro-Biden ads to try to move those numbers. Right. Let's stay on this, this subject, because it's so fascinating, the, the, this mystery of the unbudging numbers. And obviously, we all know that um, many Democrats, Democratic professionals, have a villain, mm -hmm. and the villain is us. Mm -hmm. The villain is the media that they, they say won't highlight for the American people the great economic gains, the, the way he is masterfully uh, handled the Middle East and Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. How much of this is a media issue? How much of this is, is, uh, is issues beyond media's control? How much of this just is age? People look at this guy and say, wow, he's pretty old. You know, by the way, we're the bipartisan villain. It's not just Democrats who blame us for their problems. Right. <laughs> you know, the first I have not noticed anyone blame the media for anything yeah. in the last <laughs> seven you know, years, uh, so I don't know what you're talking about. Ronald Reagan, the first president I, I covered with any seriousness, uh, was once asked, how can an actor be president? And how, he said, how can someone who is not an actor be president? Because there is part of the job that is selling yourself and connecting with voters. And I think that, the pre that President Biden is paying a price for not doing more news conferences, more traditional interviews with mainstream uh, journalists, being out there more, making his own case. The reason they're doing paid ads is because he is, for a variety of reasons, reluctant or unable to go out and make his own case. And that also feeds this concern about age. Uh, so I think that he could address both the concern about age and do a better job of selling what he's done if he were out there more. Dan, is it is it reluctance or inability to, to jump off from what Susan is talking about? I think it's a combination of both. I think there's a little bit of reluctance, and um, but he's he's actually out a lot in very structured settings, and in those settings he doesn't necessarily come across in a commanding way. And I think one of the things that we've noticed particularly people who've watched Joe Biden over many, many years, uh, he's a more subdued politician today than he used to be. I mean, he was a very animated politician as a younger man. Uh, today, he is more restrained. He's more reserved. Um, he does get credit for the way he's tried to handle the Middle East. He does get credit for the way he has handled Ukraine, but not from the public. He gets credit from people who know what those jobs entail. But that doesn't translate into political support. But I'd make one other related point. His numbers have not moved, and the ads haven't done anything for it. But if you think about this entire year, very little has moved, you know, across the board politically. I mean, this, is, this has just been a kind of a standing-in-place year. Uh, I mean, a completely paralyzed Republican primary process. Exactly. Uh, and, and public perceptions of both the president and the former president just have not changed much. Will they once we get into the, you know, the campaign season and voters are, you know, beginning to cast their votes in the primaries and there's more activity? I don't know. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about the 77-year-old person who will be running against Joe Biden, presumably, unless something happens in the paralyzed Republican race. I mean, he's, he's obviously sui generis anyway, and so he's not been judged by traditional standards of what makes 
a politician. Um, but uh, he's been making mistakes. He doesn't look like he's uh, gassed up in the same way on occasion. Obviously, some of his statements uh, have been even more outrageous. I mean, it's hard to judge if you go from 11 to 12. I don't know. But you know, anyway, he's, 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 he's becoming um, uh, more bitter, uh, angrier, a, a little disconnected in a kind of way. I mean, the, should the Republicans have that anxiety about his health and ability to perform? Well, he's a, he's a pretty big, comes across pretty vigorous. Well, he, you know? he, he projects his voice it, it, out. Yeah. He, and he, uh, it, it, and you, I, I'm sure this is very frustrating to the White House. When President Biden makes a gaffe, people will think, oh, age. When former President Trump makes a gaffe, they think, oh, there's Trump. Uh, okay. When he mistakes Sioux City Super Bowls. Right. Well, and this gets to what you were saying about the public performance aspect of this job, that you may, you know, policy wonks, you know, in D.C. be like, well, it doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is that once you entered the TV era, all the presidents started getting more handsome. And now <laughs> we're, we're in this era of sort of reality television, and the, the, the public performance aspect of this job really matters. And Trump is a former reality television star. He makes sure... Uh, you know, that he is well lit. He is like exacting about some of these standards and the way the White House is not. Mm -hmm. And uh, that being said, all the concerns about Joe Biden's age do sort of sometimes obscure the fact that a majority of voters are also concerned about Trump's age. And we know nothing about his health. He has not released even a, a flattering doctor's note. We don't know anything. <laughs> not lately. Yeah. <laughs> Another group that's gotten much more handsome in the television age, print journalists. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all agree. <laughs> On that, uh, but, but but stay 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 on this for for a minute because and and by the way, again, I, I'm I, we're having this conversation within the traditional political framework, Trump's age, gaffes, etc. He's also under multiple federal <laughs> indictments. He also led an insurrection against the Constitution, noting for the record, and that that sort of thing doesn't move. You, you know the needle one way or the other. This this kind of this 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 paralysis in in, in perception. Is there anything that's going to happen in the coming months? Do you think uh, in his in his cases uh, that might actually move the needle one way or the other? Yes, but I don't know what it is. No, I I'm being facetious. Yeah, there's very little in those cases that's likely to have an impact politically on him, unless again, you know, unless there's. Some enormous surprise. But uh, again, it's like, like Susan says, everything is baked in to your knowledge of Donald Trump already. People know what they, the, the vast majority of people know what they think about Donald Trump and about President Biden. And so there's a small group of people who will, you know, who may be swinging back and forth and will make an ultimate decision. Um, but it is not as though he is a commandingly strong standard bearer for the Republican Party for all the reasons you're citing. I mean, he, he has genuine weaknesses, uh, and they may be different than Biden's, and the question is which of those are going to be dispositive when people go into the, right. the ballot box. Let me, let me pivot and talk about uh, Mike Johnson, the new speaker, who's completed a little bit more than... Uh, it's been a big week for him. It's his first week as speaker, and it's his first week that anybody in the country knows who Mike Johnson is <laughs> also. Um, give us your thumbnail uh, view, Susan, of, of how he's doing so far with a special emphasis on this Israel-Ukraine aid package issue? Well, first of all, let's say that, let's stipulate that anyone who becomes Speaker of the House during their fourth term in Congress before they've even chaired a committee has got to be someone who has, is smart and skilled. Because he didn't, you know, he, he wasn't... It, it, it is or impressive. they ran out of other people to make Speaker. Well, there were some other people who were members of Congress who could have become Speaker. He's the one who became Speaker. I think he's come across... As uh, very, he's he's a very uh, uh, nice face on very conservative policies. Uh, I think in that way he's different from Jim Jordan, who was like a tougher personality on some of the same policies. But I think this early effort, this early plan, decision to move through this this Israeli aid package in a very partisan way by adding something, a poison pill, that guarantees that the White House would, would uh, veto it if it came to the president's desk, that makes it impossible. The Senate says they won't, the Senate majority leader says he won't take it up. The Senate Republican leader says he doesn't support this approach of dividing Ukraine aid from, from Israel aid. It tells you that he plans to cultivate and maintain the support of that 
group of Republican House members who have been so difficult for a series of speakers. Is he doing that only because that's the only way you survive in the job now? I mean, he has seen a speaker just ousted. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very well, you know, having served under a, an ousted House speaker, it is a, it's got to be sort of a, a, it's the thing, that's the monkey on his back, right? He, he's looking at this saying, I have to keep this constituency happy. This also may be the constituency that I most agree with. Oh, um, and that's so, a good point. Um, you know, if you, if you just sort of think about it's not that hard for it's him not that hard to, for to him. be nice to Matt Gates because he agrees with Matt Gates. Exactly. And so going forward, you'll likely see him continue to, um, it may look like he's appeasing this more conservative wing of the party, but he is a, a pretty central cog in right. that. Right. Adam, I want to ask you a question about the Matt Gates of the Senate, Tommy Tuberville. Uh, I go to you first. This is a very important subject, these holds that are on military promotions, on Pentagon promotions. Um, I go to you because you're from Alabama. Uh, not that it's your fault or anything, I'm not, you know, but you're from Alabama. You actually went to Texas Tech where, where Tommy Tuberville coached. Um, and you're actually an Army brat. Also, your father's a career military Army officer. Um, so you have, uh, the floor is yours. You, you, have some, you have some insight about why he's doing this and what it means. So I will say he's doing it in large part because he can. Um, if, you, if you think about the, the sort of structure of uh, elections in Alabama, right, um, it is effectively, as you, as you get to the state, statewide level, a single party state. Um, the state house in Alabama is broken into effectively all white Republicans um, and all black except for two Democrats, right? So it is a very um, li like evenly divided right. state. Um, but but Tuberville, he comes at this with a sort of, um, it's almost an, an arrogance. Senator Tuberville has a sort of arrogance about this to say that this is, uh, I, I don't want the um, federal government to be paying for people to get abortions and sending people right. out of state. Right. And so he is uh, effectively saying, I'm going to hold up these promotions. But you even have Senator Lindsey Graham. You have these veterans in the Senate. Senator who Sullivan. Effectively, yes. Wait, I want, I want you all to listen to something that Senator Tuberville said uh, in, in reference to the new Marine Corps commandant who had a, recently had a cardiac event. Um, let, listen to this for one second. I want to talk about it. Somebody said he's working 18 hours a day. Jack Reed blamed me for his heart attack. Come on, give me a break. This guy's going to work 18, 20 hours a day no matter what. That's what we do. You know, I did that for years because you got to get the job done. Susan, he is did. being a football coach yes. the same thing <laughs> as running the Marine Corps? It, it is not. I haven't done either thing. That was thing. called a softball yes. question. <laughs> I have not done either job, but I can tell you that I'm pretty sure they're different. And that's, I mean, I, I find that uh, for a guy who's been elected to office, I find that remarkable. Even if he thinks that, like it's not my fault the guy had a heart attack. I mean, what you say is, I'm really sorry he had a heart attack and we should do all we can to, you know, pray for his recovery. Right. I, I, go ahead. Well, especially when he has said, right, this is unsustainable. He said, I'm working from 5.30 to 11 p.m. This is unsustainable. He said that in a news conference just a couple of weeks ago, and then he has a heart attack. Right. This is a tough Marine. And obviously, we can't blame a single point issue. We don't know the, exactly. the, 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 the backstory of his health. But, but I mean, talk about this, because this is, this, is, this is the through line on the Hill. There are obviously a very large number of Republicans who want to govern and who want to make policy and pass laws. But all we wind up talking about is people like Matt Gates and Tommy Tuberville, because they seem to be in charge. And that, that doesn't seem to have changed. Well, I think this goes to exactly what, what you were saying, which is that they are responding to what the voters want. And the fact is, like, Tommy Tuberville is not going to be able to be beaten in Alabama because of what he is doing right now. So they are following, like, they are following the voters. And, like, the, and, that, and that's, I think, what you saw which, with Mike Johnson being installed, which essentially was a coup from the right wing of the party. They took someone who was, you know, Kevin McCarthy, who was really trying to show that he was conservative enough. And they were like, it's not enough. And they replaced him with someone who was the genuine article. And, and I think what you saw with what he's doing with Israel and Ukraine is that he, rec he sees, I mean, he sees it from, hears it from his constituents, he sees the polls. The fact of the matter is that there, there's an, a majority of the Republican Party, especially on the primary, that does not want to fund Ukraine anymore. 
And him doing this with that bill is following where the voters are and and uh, and not willing to really stand up to them. Right. I, I, I guess I guess think I disagree that uh, this is what voters want. I think that the Republicans are running a big risk by looking like they care not at all about governing. Uh, and and the, the, and you look at like. Would you would you take a bet that Republicans hold the House in the next election? Because I wouldn't take that bet. Let me let me let me ask Dan for the last word. In the short time we have left, let me ask Dan for the last word on that. Are, are we just in a period of performance artistry, uh, and there's nothing on the Hill that can reverse that kind of trend, or is it is it going to come back? For the near term, I think we are. I mean, I think I think this type of politics. I was talking to somebody who has worked in administrations, knows the Hill, who said. There was a way in which politics and legislation used to be done, but today it's not done quietly or in back rooms. It's done on social media. It's right. done on cable TV, and that creates the pressure that moves the needle. Right. Unfortunately, um, this is a great conversation, but we have to leave it there for now. I want to thank our panelists for joining us and for sharing their reporting. Um, be sure to visit theatlantic.com for my colleague David Frum's piece, Here's What Biden Can Do to Change His Grim Polling. And don't forget to tune into PBS News Weekend for the latest on calls for a ceasefire in Israel's war with Hamas. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular. This is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular... You get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.